Hello everyone and welcome back to another One Piece Saga review. Now today is technically going to be part 2 of the Dressrosa Saga, of course talking about the titular name of the saga, the Dressrosa Arc. This arc is, let's just say, eventful and I can't wait to get into this, it's going to be a really long video so we need to get right into it but just before that I'm going to ask if you could leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel and hit that naughty bell as well and literally let's get right into this video. The island to start with, the aesthetic. Uh, the island's really cool, it's a sick location and it reminds me a lot of something like Rome or an island country like Malta in Europe for example. The buildings are ancient and the centre of the country is essentially a coliseum where warriors do battle and just like Rome which I previously just mentioned, uh, however, what makes the whole thing so interesting is that everything about the way that the place operates is incredibly important to the plot and you'll see what I mean as we get further into this. Now I just want to make a statement right off the bat. Dress Rosa has some of the best writing and most importantly the most brilliant payoffs to any plot points since the time skip. Now, I know it's not been that long but uh, since the, the events of you know Marine Ford and stuff like that this is the best that One Piece has been thus far just in terms of simply just from a writing standpoint I think it's absolutely fantastic now I'm going to explain exactly why right now and buckle in because this is going to be a bit of a long explanation let's start off with the toys Dress Rosa is introduced to us as a lively island where everybody lives with peace and they live distant from the spoils of war they're dancers they're partiers and they have toys who they treat like humans and they get along with them perfectly. But despite that, the toys and the humans aren't allowed to live together and have to separate every day at night. Of course, when you're first introduced to the arc, you might think, oh, it's just one of the things like One Piece loves to do this where it's like quirks and there's always interest in different stuff to islands. But on this occasion, it is very, very different. We're introduced to a specific toy, the soldier toy who is the only one that can communicate like everybody else. He is a renowned toy around the area and is loved by everybody, but his character specifically gets interesting when we're introduced to a warrior in the Colosseum who befriends Lucy, who, uh, which is the alias for Luffy in the Colosseum. Uh, she's a girl named Rebecca. Rebecca has a relationship with the soldier toy beyond what would be seen as just a regular human toy relationship in Dress Rosa, as the soldier was intent on protecting Rebecca at all costs when, we, when they first interact with each other. We then start to find out the true ongoings of Dress Rosa quite soon after this, as we get a better look into Doflamingo, who is the main villain and the current king of Dress Rosa, and his true intentions including how he came to power. Doflamingo is celebrated as a hero in Dressrosa because of him essentially eradicating all war from the country and specifically eliminating the former king who had started the war. That is their point of view. However, in reality, Doflamingo and his family took over Dressrosa by using his string powers through his devil fruit to control the former king, whose name is Riku, like a puppet and forcing him to kill many people against his will. He manipulated the country and specifically he basically manipulated the entire public to believe that Riku was intent on doing this and when Doflamingo stepped in to quote unquote save the day he began to be regarded as the saviour of Dressrosa and somebody that everybody adored on the island. Now it goes beyond that though because we soon find out that the toys who have integrated into Dressrosa and just became a, number, a normal part of society were actually the work of one of the Doflamingo family, namely Sugar, who has the ability to turn anyone she touches into a toy and in the process making everyone in the world forget about that person's entire existence, meaning that everyone who's turned into a toy isn't missed or isn't remembered by a single person in the world, including their family members. Evidence of this is shown when Nico Robin, one of, of course, our members of the crew, is turned into a toy. And the entire time that she's a toy, Usopp completely forgets about her existence. She, he doesn't know 
who Nico Robin is. So, I mean, it is so incredibly powerful, that ability. And it's also disgraceful and disgusting and has ruined thousands of lives in the country whilst everybody who lives in the country has absolutely no idea about it. So, of course, this whole entire thing is just masked in manipulation and they have no idea what's actually going on. There also exists a species within Dressrosa that had been kept secret from the public, known as dwarves, which of course we, we know what dwarves are in the real world, but like, dwarves are like, they're like elves essentially. Um, and there's a clan called the Tontatas, which is essentially a tribe of dwarves, who were secretly being used as slaves to develop smiles, which are the artificial devil fruits that Caesar, Kaido and Doflamingo are all working together on. They were of course introduced in the last arc, Punk Hazard. A major feature of the Tontatas is that they are extremely gullible, or more fittingly, they're extremely trusting of people. For example, they assumed that Robin and Usopp were bad, right? They captured them because they were like, oh, you're bad people. Robin went, no, we're good, I promise. And they all started celebrating and they were like, oh yes, that's perfect, that's fine then. You are, you know, you're one of us. Um, it's insane. They just trust anybody just by their word. Uh, this basically means that they're very easy to manipulate. And so Doflamingo, of course, did exactly that. He also wants the princess of the dwarves, whose name is Manshiri, because she has an ability that can also grant him far longer lifespan at the expense, expense of her own. This links into the plot, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, basically, every other underground operation that Doflamingo didn't want anybody to know about were being worked on by the toys, who were in reality just enslaved humans with commands that couldn't be changed by the toy themselves. They keep their consciousness, but they aren't able to communicate or move their bodies of their own will, and so they're just completely controlled. This is because when Sugar turns them into a toy, she essentially says like, work for me, or something like that, and that is their command, meaning that their bodies are controlled to do exactly that for the rest of time, and until obviously the ability is revoked, which is the plan. This exact point is the reason why the soldier toy can speak of his own volition and plan against Doflamingo, because he was the first ever person to be turned into a toy, and Sugar made the grave error of not giving him a command because she didn't exactly know how this ability fully worked yet. Because of this, the soldier is able to go and find the Tontatas that were not being used as slaves, and the ones that were living beneath the flower field, and conjure up a plan to reverse Sugar's ability and return everybody in the underground factory to normal humans. Obviously not just to help with the takedown of Doflamingo, but obviously also to just free the people that have been enslaved and allow them to return to their families and live their lives that were taken away from them unfairly. Because Usopp and Robin just happened to find themselves in that part of Dressrosa when obviously them and Law at the very start of the arc were trying to swap Caesar, uh, they got dragged into this as well. And so they were part of the plan as well to reverse the ability of Sugar. The arc began right, initially, with a plan, with the goal of getting Kiemon's friend Kanjiro back, as they were aware he was being held in Dressrosa, as well as using Caesar to get to Doflamingo, and using Doflamingo to get to Kaido, thanks to the link with the Smiles operation that they all had. However, it soon turned from that into absolute chaos in the best possible way. All of a sudden, we were dealing with the Mera Mera no Mi, Ace's Devil Fruit, which he had before he died, and a battle tournament that was in place to win it, to the introduction of Rebecca and her history, to then the reveal about the toys and the plan to free them, and then of course, they realised that it would obviously be impossible to use Doflamingo to get to Kaido, he's way too strong for that, and so that the real goal should be to just take down Doflamingo. And because of this, we get way more on Trafalgar Law's backstory, including his entire life story, as well as his strong links to the Doflamingo family, and the reasons for his actions up to this point. This arc starts with an interesting premise, and becomes a hundred thousand times more interesting along the way. 
and this is where I'm kind of going to get into more of that right now. Starting with Rebecca's backstory. It's sad in the first place that she had her mother killed by her request for food, essentially bringing instant regret upon herself as a tiny child, which is unfair, of course, to then having this soldier appear with her body saying that he tried to protect her and that he'll now protect Rebecca at any cost because, of course, she is orphaned, or, or so she thinks. Their relationship, whilst he's starting to raise her and she's beginning to be more comfortable around the soldier, is great to see and is quite emotional. However, that doesn't even compare to the feeling surrounding it once you realise that the soldier was actually Rebecca's father all along and because of the way that the toy rules work, explained earlier of course, uh, she forgot that he ever existed and he simply had to pretend to just be a soldier whilst being a great father to her the whole time, essentially in his own mind without her ever understanding that. It was weird that they never mentioned the dad and so it makes perfect sense once this is of course revealed. When Sugar's ability is finally revoked thanks to quote unquote God Usopp as they uh, dub him, uh, scaring her, uh, oh, look, basically Usopp scared Sugar beyond consciousness. Um, when that happens, it is the most satisfying feeling, seeing Rebecca just stop in her tracks and simply say, I have a father, whilst her tears start to fall. It's incredible, and the fact that we started with this random soldier toy who could talk, who was showing Zoro and all of that around town, to him being Rebecca's dad, is incredible. Even more importantly than that though, it's revealed that the identity of her father is Kiros, a legendary warrior of the Colosseum who fought 1000 times and never lost a fight. He has a statue in the Colosseum and is revered as a legend, but like a legend in terms like a myth. Whilst everybody including Luffy and Rebecca were questioning whether he ever really existed, that took place in the first 10 episodes of this arc and it means that the entire story of Rebecca and her family was foreshadowed way before anybody could have realised it. Again, it's incredible. And Oda really, truly shows his genius as a writer once again. I absolutely love this plot point, and it's funny that it's only just a small part of the, the wider picture of Dress Rosa. Now, not too long after that, we get Law's backstory, which is quite simply just harrowing. Law grows up in a beautiful town called Flevance, where everything is pure white thanks to the unique material used to build everything, named amber lead, which could only be found in this town. The problem with this ore was that if it was dug up and specifically touched, then the people who touched it would develop the amber lead disease, which slowly kills you with no apparent cure. Like the bastards that they are though, the world government alongside the higher ups of Flevance decided not to tell the residents about this, which caused the poisonous disease to spread like wildfire through the town, meaning that everybody in contact with it would die eventually, and with the effects of the disease being slow for the first few generations of the families who would have touched this, they were able to, you know, have offspring and stuff like that, and that just meant that the newest generations had life expectancies of like 10 or even less than that. This left the residents of Flevance pretty much on the brink of death all at the same time, and what made matters worse was that everybody believed that the disease was contagious, and therefore the neighbouring nations were raiding uh, Flevance and essentially killing the residents ruthlessly. Whilst a raid was taking place, Law stumbled upon a big group of children, which included his younger sister, as well as a nun who was trying to take care of them all and she asked Law to go with them, but Law decided to go and see his parents first, and then go back to them. So he goes to see his parents, and as he goes to see them, he sees them being shot dead right in front of his eyes. He then returns to where the nun and the group of kids were, and they'd all drop dead from the disease, including his younger sister, who was also now lying dead right in front of him. His entire family and his entire town wiped out with nothing that he could do within one night. As you can imagine, this spawned an immense deal of hatred towards the world and anybody in it, and changed the boy into a vengeful, edgy one, which is of course completely understandable. What changed this 
was, in fact, the movement of his hatred from everybody to one singular man, who happened to go by the name of Don Quixote do Flamingo. This is because Corazon, do Flamingo's blood brother, who supposedly couldn't speak, was actually undercover as a marine, trying to stop do Flamingo from exacting more terror and evil on the world, and therefore was trying to stop him in any way possible. Law learns of Corazon's truth without him revealing that he was a marine because Law hated the world government due to their involvement in the destruction of his hometown and so Corazon knew he couldn't mention that. And Corazon tells Law that there may be a way to cure his amber lead disease, which was due to kill him in a few months because he was around that age bracket. That way was to retrieve the Ope Ope no Mi devil fruit which would allow Law to heal himself in any way, essentially do surgery on any part of his body within himself. It just happened that Do Flamingo was also after the fruit so that he could force somebody to grant him eternal life in exchange for their own, one of the ultimate abilities of this devil fruit. They went on the hunt for it and Corazon finally managed to get the fruit and give it to Law, meaning that Do Flamingo of course couldn't be granted eternal life. Unfortunately, Corazon was found out by Virgo, as well as eventually Doflamingo himself, and Doflamingo eventually shoots Corazon in multiple places, killing his own blood brother, whilst Corazon was able to let Law get away, sacrificing his life for the sake of Law. It's just a truly incredible story, and to be honest, there's not much more explanation needed than that description. It made Law desperate to avenge his saviour, by killing Do Flamingo, and that's the reason that he's come so far as a pirate today. It adds further stakes in the upcoming fight, and adds way more depth to an already fascinating character. Not to mention, by the way, that D is a secret letter in Law's name, and that was revealed in this flashback, meaning that potentially he has more ties to Luffy than we previously knew, and it also gives a bit of context as to why Law wanted to save Luffy after the fight at Marineford. As I referred to with Law's backstory, the true and pure evil of Doflamingo is revealed along the way in this arc, and put it this way, he's worse than I ever could have imagined. To start, the Don Quixote family were one of the founding clans of the world government, meaning that Doflamingo is a descendant of them, making him, and the current generation of his family, celestial dragons which meant that he just ended up growing up adopting the personality of a celestial dragon, which, of course, is the absolute worst type of people in this universe. He still somehow surpassed them in horrible levels, though. Enslaving dwarves to produce fake devil fruits for the benefit of an evil emperor? Yeah, that's pretty bad. Enslaving thousands of humans and forcing them to do unpaid work 24 hours a day and having the existence of these people removed from everyone's mind? meaning that their own families have no idea who they are, yeah, that's also pretty bad. But here's the thing, Doflamingo's evil isn't explained from one or two actions, it's just shown to us through everything about the guy. His personality is rotten, he cares about absolutely nobody apart from himself, including his own crew, dubbed his family by the way, and his own blood family. He blamed his dad for trying to live a normal life, and therefore, when they were treated badly by the public, as people of course do not like celestial dragons, which is very understandable, he decided to kill his own father and take his father's head to the Navy headquarters. As a fucking child. He was born an evil bastard. For the minute he talked, he was evil. And every single day he's walked the planet, he's had evil intentions. That's why he manipulated the entire country of Dressrosa and why for the last decade he's been ruining these people's lives without them even noticing it. He's just truly the definition of an awful bastard, which makes seeing Luffy and Law take him on one of the most satisfying moments in the show so far, and it just builds intrigue for the climax of this battle. Now, before I talk about that fight, I have to talk about a few smaller things that to me are still very significant in this arc, or well, not just to me, to everybody. Treble is the worst character in One Piece, and that's my mind made up on that. He's worse than Spandom, and if you watch my Ennis Lobby review, you know how much I hate that guy. His nay, nay, nay 
in this fucking slobbery, annoying ass voice is probably the worst character quirk in the series. Even worse than Caesar's Shirororororo, which is also unbearable. The voice actor is dog shit, and I'm not afraid to say that. Sorry to my boy, uh, Treble's voice actor, but sorry, mate, your voice is so annoying. Uh, the character design is horrendous and makes me want to turn my monitor off every single time I see him. And holy shit, is his ability disgusting as well. He basically has the mucus mucus fruit, and I can't do it justice through words how much I find this grim. It is so fucking grim. He's a nasty bastard as well, who essentially added a bit of oil onto the fire that was Doflamingo's evil personality. He even brags about how Doflamingo is this ultimate evil, and he sounds really proud of that. He's a scumbag, as well as the most unbearable character in One Piece, and I can't stand him. Genuinely. And now I feel a, a, a bit less passionate about this one, but I need to mention him as well, because to me, Pika is also pointless and very annoying. Thanks to, essentially, his voice, um, that is the entire reason why he's so annoying. Like, the, the voice, as soon as I heard it, I was like, no, no, definitely not. Funny for five seconds, maybe. Now I'm just sick of it. It's so annoying and really, really dumb. His introduction also, to be fair, just feels like padding. And there's no need for any padding in this story, in this arc whatsoever, when the arc is over a hundred chapters long. It just feels like if Pika didn't exist, nothing would have really changed in this arc at all. And that is extremely frustrating because, well, we don't need that. Like I just said, this arc's over a hundred chapters long. As long as it is, we could have probably cut out like two or three chapters worth if Pika just didn't exist. And that probably would have helped maybe the perception of this arc as a whole. Another thing is that there is so many people here, and it's mainly new characters, but also a couple of old ones, such as Jesus Burgess, who reappears, who is of course a member of the Blackbeard Pirates. Most importantly though, it would take me too long to name everybody, but pretty much everybody who fights in the Devil Fruit competition at the Colosseum eventually becomes a friend of Luffy and becomes incredibly grateful for essentially saving them as they were part of the plan to help uh, do, uh, take down Doflamingo, but they were too weak to do it. And so I think it's amazing that it's really cool uh, that they all swear allegiance to Luffy at the end of the arc and uh, essentially declaring that whilst they're all start, still going to live however they want because that's the freedom that they're chasing, when Luffy finds himself in trouble, they're sure to use the Vivre card that he gave them all to go and help their new friend. It's a really nice way to wrap things up and uh, for the record, I think that Cavendish is hilarious and is one of my favourite new characters from this arc. If you remember Cavendish, if you've read this arc, uh, let me know your thoughts because I can imagine him being quite a dodgy character, uh, quite controversial, but I personally really like him. And one of them as well is Bartolomeo, who, yes, is kind of cool, but is also really annoying with the over-infatuation with the straw hats. Um, it's, like, overbearing at times. It's quite heavy. But anyway... Um, Violet is really, really cool. She's one of my favourite characters. She's introduced as a Sanji love interest, as of course most girls are in this show. Um, and let's be real, that's true. Um, and whilst initially she's trying to manipulate him, she very quickly is revealed to be a member of the formal royal family and is another victim of Doflamingo's wrongdoing. She's actually the daughter of King Riku, and is revealed to be Scarlet's sister, meaning that she is Rebecca's aunt. It's all just Lincoln, and it's just so amazing. At the very end of the arc as well, she is two seconds away from having the most brutal and devastating death in the show. But luckily, a certain man comes to save the day, save the day which more on that soon. Her ability is also fantastic, using the Senrigan way before Kishimoto gave Ada that ability in Boruto a few years later. Now, I don't care who done it first, the ability is so cool regardless, I love Ada and I love Violet. It's also heavily useful when she goes into an alliance with the Straw Hats, as they're of course trying to save Dress Rosa. Now, I believe this is one of the first and also probably the last negative for this arc um, that I need to speak on. And that is that Usopp, for me, in the first half of this arc, is purely unbearable. Listen, I understand that part of his character is meant to be that he's shit scared of everything and anything. 
But I also thought, just, listen, I might be wrong, but I thought that the entire point of a character in media is to see them progress and change as the story goes along. I personally think that. And you can see that through characters like Nami and Chopper, who were the exact same as Usopp pre-time skip, but have progressed tremendously because they've become a lot stronger. Usopp has one of the coolest and most diverse abilities in the series, despite just being a normal guy and no devil fruit and anything like that, and could be one of the strongest characters if he put his mind to it, but he's too busy being such a bitch half the time. Usopp's best arc by a mile was at Eni's lobby. He progressed a lot as a character in that arc, and he was a lot more brave and willing to fight. Where has that Usopp gone? Because me personally, I want him back. ASAP. Now, back to the positives. I love Luffy and Rebecca's relationship. He's almost like a hero figure for Rebecca by the end of the arc, and I absolutely love it. Luffy's a lot more nice to her than he is to most people, and you can definitely see that she genuinely appreciates everything that he's done for her. I just hope that we see her again, because overall, she's just a really great character. And another positive from a different kind of angle is the birdcage, Doflamingo's ability. Which, in my opinion, it was a really good idea from a writing point of view. If Oda hadn't put that in, then the intensity simply wouldn't be there, or at least it wouldn't be there to the degree that it is right now. Uh, during the arc. Knowing that they had barely any time to get to Doflamingo and then defeat him and release the cage before it turned into an absolute bloodbath just makes it so much more exciting. It's done perfectly and it creates one of my favourite parts of the arc personally which is essentially the counter-offensive part of the arc when Zoro, Frankie and Bartolomeo fight alongside everyone to try and stop the cage. A major effort from hundreds of people you know, rallying the troops, if you will, is enough for me to love something. I know it's simple, but to me, it just it just feels so good. Uh, and now, right on to the fight, because this is, of course, the most um, built up, the most intriguing part of the arc. Now, Doflamingo is strong. Like, really strong. He introduces us to something known as an awakened devil fruit, essentially meaning that Doflamingo has become the master of the string fruit, and can now manipulate anything and everything around him due to that evolution. It also makes him impossible to beat for Luffy, especially with three gears and multiple different Gomu Gomu attacks as we know along the years. That of course means that as he is on the losing side, he's able to activate the ability that Rayleigh had helped him develop during the time skip, Gear 4. Now Gear 4 is really, really cool and also shows Luffy's underrated battle IQ. He's able to make a mixture of his devil fruit and his mastery of Haki to essentially create this incredible powerful gear that makes Luffy unbelievably fast but also really powerful in any attack that lands. He has armament Haki applied all over his entire body and has an ability to fire up his punches almost like a cannon, making them 10 times more powerful than they would be otherwise. Now, Doflamingo is still too strong for this version of Gear 4, and after the expiry of the ability, Luffy has to go 10 minutes without being able to move, because his body is restoring his haki, because Gear 4 drains Luffy of all of his haki. This leaves the entirety of Dressrosa in limbo, as it's been established by this point that Luffy is by far the strongest person on the island right now, in terms of somebody who can fight Doflamingo. Now, Gats, who is the announcer of the Colosseum fights, way back at the very start of the arc, offers to carry Luffy on his back to give him time to regenerate his haki. But the problem is that the birdcage is set to close one minute before Luffy wakes back up, and therefore everybody on the island would die, meaning that they physically had to push back the birdcage even just a tiny little bit so that they could essentially stall it and make sure that the very second that Luffy wakes up, he has to instantly swarm Doflamingo and try and defeat him. Now, it's worth noting that Doflamingo was heavily injured, just like Luffy, in their first altercation, meaning that Luffy essentially needed to land one big blow to win. But trust me, that is a lot harder than it sounds. He comes with a different plan the second time, though, 
offering a different variation of Gear, Gear 4 known as the King Kong Gun to take down Doflamingo for good and free the Dressrosa natives from the hell that they'd undergone for the last decade. Me personally, I still maintain that it should have been law to beat him. I think that would have made sense narratively, but I understand main character and all that. I get it, okay? I get it. In this process, the rest of the crew are able to destroy the Smile Factory, and they, of course, earlier freed all the toys from the hell that they'd also been lived uh, living in the past 10 years as well, leaving the country as heroes. Now, the background of the royal family is really cool. In terms of the way to wrap this arc up, they were the royal family who actually did save Dressrosa from war like 800 years ago, before Doflamingo changed everybody's mind on the Riku family thanks to his manipulation. And the fact that Rebecca is hated at the start of this arc for being a royal, but then by the end of the arc, they accept Riku back as the king of the country really does feel like a mission accomplished type moment. Kiros plans on leaving because he's too ashamed of his past, but is then reintegrated into the family as Rebecca is essentially able to forgive him in a split second, probably because of how much he did for her as he was the soldier toy. Regardless of what his bad past was, Rebecca was incredibly happy to accept him into the family and back into normal life. Now there's a couple of things that I need to talk about. We are also introduced to Kaido for the first time at the end of this arc and um, he's going to be really pissed because of the smile production stopping. Let's put it that way. I am nearly done with Zo, and I've learned just a bit more about this stuff as at the time of recording and let's just say the next couple of arcs are going to be absolutely incredible. Now, I had to save the best and the most emotional part for last. And that is fucking Sabo, man. He's back. His backstory is incredible. And it makes perfect sense as to why he never tried to reconnect with both Ace and Luffy this whole time. Which is something that I'd been wondering straight away as soon as we found out he was alive. It's like, bro, well, what have you been doing this whole time? Um, the fact that the news of Ace's death was essentially the cure for Sabo's amnesia. And he remembered the bond that they had at that exact moment. For some reason, that just set something off with me. It made me really emotional. And it really did hurt. But I was just so happy at the same time to see him back. In my opinion, Oda couldn't have done this any better. Because having the Mera Mera fruit teased, thinking that Luffy was potentially going to take it, but then seeing Sabo appear really did make it all feel so warm. And just like, just right, if you know what I mean. Sabo can carry on Ace's will, and do justice to Ace's great legacy as the Fire Fist, whilst now also being there to protect his little brother Luffy. I couldn't have asked for anything better, and I thought that seeing him say the exact same line that Ace said to the Straw Hats at Alabasta right at the end of the arc was absolute perfection. Something along the lines of, my little brother can be a pain in the neck, but thank you so much for looking after him. It's basically what he says, and it is the perfect wrap-up to what has honestly been an absolute masterpiece of an arc. So to wrap up the video, Kanjiro was saved, Smile Factory was destroyed, which is essentially what we came to uh, Dressrosa for, Doflamingo's arrested, the Straw Hats have six new allegiances, and the Law One has remained intact, Dressrosa is saved, their old king is reinstated, Kiros and Rebecca are able to live as father and daughter again, Luffy has gear 4, and Sabo is back. An incredible arc that doesn't get enough praise in my eyes. Pika and Treble aside, and maybe Senor Pink as well, who I didn't talk about in this video because I just don't find them that interesting to be honest. Um, apart from those three, this arc is near perfect. I would rank the post time skip sagas so far, the first two. Number one would be Dressrosa, and number two would be Fishman Island. Uh, and the arc ranking within this saga, it would be number one, Dressrosa, and number two, Punk Hazard. I think both of them are extremely clear. I think Dressrosa is potentially a top three arc in One Piece. I'll need to see how that kind of changes by the end of the uh, story and how much this arc kind of 
settles in my mind, but right now I believe this is genuinely one of the best arcs that Oda has ever created, and I think it is pretty much special from front to back. Thank you so much for watching this entire video. I've been recording for 37 minutes, the video will probably end up being somewhere from 33 to 34, so if you watch the whole way, you have no idea how much I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave a couple of One Piece videos on the screen if you would like to continue watching, which will include my playlist to watch all the saga reviews if you would like to check out my thoughts on the arcs previous, as well as a tier list which has not done well at all on YouTube, but I was hoping it would, but it is what it is. I have a pre-time skip arc tier list there if you want to watch that. That is 35 minutes more of content. Again, I'm going to ask if you could leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, as well as subscribing and hitting the noti bell, it would mean the world to me. Thank you so much for watching this incredibly long video, and goodbye.